Well, what can I do about human trafficking? You may be asking that question, and today I have answers for you on the podcast. Welcome back to the Faith of the Fathers podcast. I'm your host, Carl Gessler, here to reignite the faith of the fathers. And immediately after recording this podcast, I'm going to be going with my son uh, and a friend, and I believe his daughter, and, oh, my daughter actually is coming too, she just decided, um, to go see the Sound of Freedom movie. We haven't seen it yet, and honestly, I haven't really wanted to see it because I already know about uh you know what's going on, and it's a bit overwhelming. Um, but I know that's really no excuse. We everyone needs to be aware of this. Um, but I do know uh, it's it's not because I don't know about it. It's because I do, and I'm already dealing with it on a regular basis. I'm already interacting with people who have been trafficked, uh, and you know we say trafficked. There are people that are there are human beings, there are children being trafficked uh, for all sorts of reasons, sex. Um, for drugs, they're being murdered, they're being sacrificed. Satanic ritual abuse is a big part of human trafficking. And I hold up this book because I've interviewed Chantal Fry on this podcast, and you can go back in the archives, look that up, um, about her speaking out, her life under uh, an escape from satanic ritual abuse. I've also interviewed um, friends of mine, and I've, I have friends who are survivors. I have multiple friends who are survivors of satanic ritual abuse. This is not a small thing. It's not an isolated thing. Uh, It's everywhere. Um, And one of the things that I know um, that is part of this movie or at the end of the movie, Sound of Freedom, that they say is that the number one consumer in the world uh, for humans, buying humans for sex and other things, is the United States of America. Uh, So the red light district in America is across the whole country, And Washington, D.C. is kind of the glowing red spot. It's actually central to this whole thing, the border issue. Uh, So we know this. Many of us know this, but many more people need to know human trafficking is not only real, it's massive, it's widespread, and we must do something about it. So uh, I know a lot of people have watched this movie, and they've come away saying, like, well, what can we do about it? What uh, what can we do about it? I I watched a clip um, about... Uh, a little boy being rescued. And, um, you know, when you watch a movie, there's got to be, there's got to be hope, especially when you're in such a dark situation. And of course, the hope of this story is that these um, children are being rescued. You know, the the scene that I did see from it was uh, a man at the border is trying to uh, traffic a child. He gets caught and the child gets rescued. And it's heartbreaking because, um, Jim Caviezel, who's playing Tim Ballard in it, asks the boy, what's your name? And the boy says, my name is Teddy Bear, which is, of course, the name uh, that the uh, the sick people tra- trafficking him taught him to have. Like, that's his role. It was some uh, sexual role. And uh, he says, no, what's your real name? And the boy in tears tells him his real name. Um, and then he rescues him. He, like, he realizes that this man, Tim, is... Uh, for him. He's here to rescue him. Um, And I actually want to play for you right now uh, a clip of uh, Tim Ballard sharing uh, one of his, his, I don't want, I was going to say adventures. That sounds too um, like fun. It wasn't, uh, but his um, experiences going into um, what was a a fake orphanage to rescue children. Um, And I want you to hear how this, how the story ends. I get this intel about this orphanage. We're actually looking for an American citizen child who had been kidnapped in Haiti and all evidence led to this false orphanage. And I remember working with the police and they said, we don't know what this place is. It wasn't a registered orphanage, so they're clearly selling kids. I'm standing at this gate under the instruction of the Haitian government to go in undercover. I have cameras all over me. And I'm going in to look for this one little boy we're looking for, but they said, look, if if they're selling kids to you, you have to buy one. And that will catch them in the act and we'll know what their intent is, what they're doing. 
So something happened outside that gate. I looked in and I had never seen so many kids. My defenses let down and I started having this occurrence that I'm supposed to fight, which is I start seeing my kids' faces again. And I'm like, okay, standing outside the gate, let's do my practices, let's do my meditation, get it out. And something told me, I think it was God, don't do it. And I was so scared, because I'm like, am I gonna freak out? So I walk into the place and within minutes, they're offering me this, whatever I want. I was like, walk into a pet store. This one's beautiful, this one does this. I turn around and I see this little boy and he didn't see me. I was looking at the back of his head, and but something happened. Some cool spiritual connection because this little boy just about faces, looks right at me. He's about a year and a half, throws his hands in the air and walks over to me. And I pick him up and I hold him. And I just felt this call. Like, this is the one you're supposed to buy. So I walk into this outbuilding and the deeper I get into the belly of this smelly, dark, edifice the quieter it gets and I flip around and there's this beautiful child with a bloody gash over her eye um, there's a lot of abuse happening the the teacher there's a guy named the teacher there who literally carried a whip around his neck so I, I'm curious there's this little girl and she's looking at me like pissed like she's gonna scream or something so I give her a candy bar and I tell her take it outside and eat it outside which always works you know I have a bunch of kids this works but this little girl does something I've never seen a kid do. She takes that candy bar and she cuts it in half. It was like muscle memory, not even thinking, and placed the other half of the bar into this little boy's hands. And, and that's when it hit me. This little boy is the little brother. So I kneel down and take both their hands and tell them, I, it's the first time I ever broke the cardinal rule of undercover operations by revealing who I was. And I told them through the best Creole that I could and a little English, and they got it. I'm on your side. I'm not taking your little brother. We're staying together. You're staying together. We end up getting to the hotel. The deal is done. Money's exchanged. The cops come in, arrest everybody, and it's awesome. It's a great thing. They raid the orphanage, get the other 26 kids out and into good homes and good places. And I call my wife that night. I hear this silence on the other line as I tell this story. And she says, where are their parents? So the parents are dead. Where are they going to go now? Well, they're going to go to an orphanage in Haiti that's at least safe. They're not selling the kids, at least. And she said, I can't. I can't let that happen. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, I want to be their mother. I said, what are you, crazy? We have six kids. I just quit my job. We have no savings. Um, and she's like, I don't care. That has no bearing on this decision. When I feel it, I'm gonna do it. We worked on it for several years uh, and brought Cole and Colleen, my brother and sister home, and they're now our family. And it was the best thing I ever did. So Tim, uh, and you know, the happy, the happy story here is that these children get rescued. Uh, the happy part with Jim Caviezel when in the movie is that he rescues this boy, that he's not there to traffic him, he's there to rescue him. And that is absolutely heroic. It's absolutely awesome. You know, um, if, if our military existed for the sake of rescuing uh, children in that plight, I would want my boys, uh, not my girls, in any situation, except maybe people attacking our home, and take a gun and go shoot them you know like that that's the i want my girls to be able to handle themselves in that way but i would never send my girls into the military but that's an aside but if if that's what our military existed for i would want my boys to uh be willing to do that like that i would encourage them toward that end unfortunately i don't trust that our military won't attack the american citizens at some point if we don't see massive change uh but you know, it's awesome that someone like Tim was willing to sacrifice so much to uh, to go rescue these children, and that is absolutely heroic, and I think every man should feel that in their heart to, to do. Um, but that is only the beginning of rescue. And we see this in the Bible, that God rescued a people out of slavery. He let, rescued Israel out of Egypt, but then they spent 40 years in the wilderness with God trying to get Egypt out of them. 
you know the the uh, trafficking world. <clears throat> all abuse is open doors to demons. Emotional abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, spiritual abuse. They all open doors to demons. And the more severe the abuse, the wider that door is. Um, So rescuing children who have been severely abused uh, in being kidnapped, being lied to, being beaten, being drugged, and then the uh, the unmentionable sexual assault and uh, ritualistic abuse, being forced to witness horrific things. There are so many layers of uh, abuse there. The, d- the demonic activity is overwhelming. Um, and so, you know, what can you do about it? A lot of us think, well, I, I, you know, one, the military doesn't seem to be interested under the current leadership in actually doing something about this. Uh, and uh, two, I'm not in the military. Uh, maybe you're old, too old for the military. Maybe you're too weak um, and like I said, you can join the military and not not be involved in rescuing them. Are you going to do it yourself? Are you trained for that? Are you trained to, you know, how are you going to go in and rescue these kids? Most of the people are just like, this is evil. I don't know what to do about it. And it turns into a political football instead of somebody actually doing something about it. But you, if you are a child of God, if you are a baptized, blood-bought uh, Christian, someone who is washed in the blood of Jesus— then you can do more about human trafficking than anybody else on the entire planet. As a matter of fact, that is the story of the Bible, that the children of Abraham are the solution to the problem of evil in the world. It is through Abraham and his family that God intends to rescue the world. He did it first and foremost through his son, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful Israelite, the faithful descendant of Abraham, who accomplished what God had promised. But Jesus said, After his resurrection, he said, All authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I commanded you. And what did Jesus command us to do? Heal the sick, cast out demons, and preach the gospel. And the gospel is that the kingdom of God has come on earth as it is in heaven, in and through Jesus' death and resurrection. So Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And just like in Genesis, where God breathes on his human creatures, and it says man became a living being, Jesus breathed on his disciples, and men once again woke up and came alive, only even more than we were before, because now we have the knowledge of good and evil, and now we finally have been broken through the power and the blood of Jesus from the power of evil, and we can choose good. So we're volunteering to agree with God. That's what it means to be his image bearers, because God does not coerce us. He does not force us. God invites us to share in his nature. And that is what we were designed to do. We will never be whole. We will never be complete until we volunteer to uh, embrace his nature, to share his image, because that's what we were designed to do. So we can do that now. Uh, but deliverance ministry, as you know, if you've been with me for any time at all, is not common. Thankfully, praise God, there's a great revival taking place of, of it right now. Um, but still, much of the church doesn't want anything to do with it. They're scared to death of it. So I want to ask you today, you know, you, what can you do about uh, for these kids? Um, because they are demonized. That's a fact. Uh, And not only are they demonized, they have DID, many of them, uh, which is Dissociation Identity Disorder, which is a whole other level to deliverance uh, ministry, which is something that happens when um, a child is traumatized um, under the age of eight, and the trauma trauma is so much, uh, so overwhelming, they can't bear it. And they actually split off, their personality splits off so that part of their personality carries the pain, and the other part um, escapes. They kind of leave their body. Um, It's a weird thing. It's not something I would have believed if I hadn't witnessed it myself, that that I know people who deal with this, um, and and I now know a lot of people who do. And I've seen it in action where someone totally switches their personality. Uh, it's, um, It's like two different people in the same 
person, and yet they share the same body, and they are actually the same person, but one part of them is frozen in time. So that, uh, so let's say that I was a split person, um, then I could say you know, one day you're talking to me, and I tell you that I um, planted a garden and that I have some blackberries growing. Uh, and then the next day that I see you, or even the next minute, the next 30 minutes, whatever, um, you talk to me and you say, how's your garden coming? And I I would say, what garden? I don't have a garden because I'm actually like, there are actually two different people that sh- that don't share all the same memories living within me. And it is still me, but it's split. Uh, it's like split parts of me. They're com- com- compartmentalized in order to protect from pain. It's a way of burying memory. So if you, uh, there are, you don't have to be satanic, lit- satanically ritually abused or trafficked to have split parts. You just have to be traumatized in a severe way. And there are many people who have blocked memories of uh, their childhood. They have whole sections of their history just blocked to their consciousness because of traumatic events. So um, this is something that is actually quite common because of the massive amounts of abuse, uh, the rise of Satanism uh, and uh, Freemasonry and all sorts of things that um, has caused this to become so widespread. So uh, the when we see these children getting rescued and we say, what can I do about it? We need to get involved in deliverance ministry, including the depths of helping people heal from satanic ritual abuse. And we are called to do this by God's grace. So who else is going to do it? Some people like Tim Ballard, praise God, can go and swoop in with their special training, their special ops, their uh, their weapons, um, and they can rescue these kids. But who is going to set them free from demons? Who is going to help them heal from dissociative identity disorder? If it's not the church, it's nobody because it's only in the authority of Jesus. It's only by the power of Jesus. It's only through his blood that this is even possible. The world doesn't know about casting out demons, and much of the church doesn't know about casting out demons. So we can rescue kids all day long, uh, and this is the foster system is full of kids who are wrecked with abuse, and we are so inadequately uh, prepared to deal with them. Um, I know of multiple situations where people have taken in foster children out of the goodness of their hearts, only have to, after much pain and suffering and trauma themselves, having to return the children back to the foster care system because of the violence of young children, five-year-olds, eight-year-olds, ten-year-olds who are threatening people with murder. They're threatening to kill people. They're attacking people with knives. They have to be locked in their rooms because Full-grown adults can't handle a five-year-old or a seven-year-old because of the amount of violence coming out of them. That is not normal. That is not human activity. That is demonic activity. And if you don't know how to cast out demons, how are you going to help them? So are we just going to rescue these children? Are we going to uh, uh, either, one, abandon these children to trafficking and the, the hell world the hell world that they live in, which also, you know, it doesn't stay in those in those dark places, and this is a purely selfish motive, those children grow up to be adults, some of them, those who survive childhood, they, because of the split personality, they still can function in a way that will appear normal. Um, But they're also sometimes those who snap and do very violent things because uh, snapping isn't really the right word. There are multiple personalities in them, and some of those personalities are highly demonized and extremely angry. And so we wonder why what what um, possesses somebody to go in and shoot up a school. Uh, we wonder what possesses people to do some of these evil things that we hear, and it's because of the of the network of evil, the organized evil. There is a mob of evil that comes from the pit of hell. The mob is highly organized. The mafia. Uh, it there there is a whole system of government. It's like a pseudo-government, and they have power. Uh, they manipulate people. They destroy people. They they acquire wealth. The spiritual world, the demonic world, functions the same way. There is an agenda. There are lords and overlords. There are little uh, underlings. There are 
assignments for uh, hit men. There is this whole system, this whole network of evil that is uh, intentional, it's organized, and it's aimed directly at us and at our, our children. And Jesus knows about it, which is why he died on the cross, to rescue us from evil, to rescue us from death, from sin. And it's why he commissioned us as his followers to do the things he did, which was proclaim the gospel. This is it. The kingdom of God is here, which means this evil and injustice that the sound of freedom emphasized that brought to light this evil in the world, God has dealt with it through Jesus. All the evil in the world, everything that we've done and everything that we've that has been done to us, all the shame, the pain, all of it was laid on Jesus. I don't think we fully appreciate the fact that Jesus, after being physically tortured, um, was hung naked on a tree. That is, uh, there's so much shame in that. You know, you think about the sexual abuse that you or someone else has undergone, uh, and you think, well, you know, how could God allow this? Well, God bore it himself. Jesus was also sexually abused when he was hung up naked on a cross, and he bore your shame. Uh, so he did all of that so that he could commission us to take his victory and apply it to the world. And part of the point of existence, I think this is the main point of existence, is that we have that knowledge of good and evil. So we have the capacity to do many evil things. Many people ask that, like, why does God allow evil in the world? It's because allowing evil allows love to exist. If we didn't have the option, we couldn't love. So there is very much evil in the world, but the beautiful thing is that we get to, in spite of what's been done to us, we can be free to, from that because Jesus bore it for us. Besi- and in, despite what we have done, we can be free from that because Jesus bore our sins on the cross. So we can be free now, and it, with the knowledge of good and evil, we can freely choose the good, and we can allow Jesus to fill us up, just like demons fill people uh, to use their bodies to for their agenda. The Holy Spirit, if we will welcome him, comes into us and fills us and empowers us to do the healing, renewing, delivering, saving work of Jesus in and through our bodies. The devil doesn't come up with anything original. He only mimics and destroys. So it's God's idea that we would be filled with a spirit that enables us and empowers us to do great things. It's the devil's distortion. It's the devil's perversion that that has um, that he perverted angels uh, and spirits that they would all, they would fill us to do evil things, but Jesus is greater. Greater is He that is in me than He that is in the world. Satan has power, but Jesus has all power, as Isaiah Saldivar says, and I love that. So, what can you do about child trafficking? About human trafficking, you can learn to cast out demons. You need to begin, and if you have never done it, you need to. Go through deliverance yourself. That's the first place to begin. Go through deliverance so you understand how to set the captives free. Because these children need homes, and they need homes where people are prepared for the demonic powers that are going to come with these children. They're prepared to deal with it. And that is something that we are uh, woefully behind on in the church and learning, but we can do and I'm doing it. I'm learning to do it. And, you know, people ask me, like, um, you know, they want to be trained. And there is training. You know, there is, um, I've been training myself by just exposing myself to a ton of uh, other people who are doing this. Daniel Adams, Isaiah Saldivar, Mike Signorelli, Vlad Savchuk, um, uh, Alexander Pagani. Um, and, you know, there's there's education, but Americans can be so addicted to education, uh, they never get busy doing stuff. And we need to be make sure that, yeah, get educated. But you know what? Once you get the general idea, the best education is just start doing it. You know, do it side by side with someone who will keep you accountable. Someone, you know, it doesn't mean that other person have to, has to have uh, more experience than you. You just need to have someone else in the room who can say, hey, you know what, I uh, I think you got a little out of hand there or whatever, or I think you missed this, or I don't think that's the right thing to say. Whatever it is, have accountability there, but just start doing the work. 
Who taught the disciples? Jesus taught them, but it, Jesus was doing his ministry for three and a half years, and the disciples were casting out demons early on in that ministry. They didn't have endless training. The training is learning to overcome your fear. The training is learning to deal with any spirit of rejection or fear of man that's in your life. So go through deliverance yourself and then have the humility to step out with the risk of failing, with the risk of falling on your face. But the only real failure, if you try to do deliverance and fail, that's not a failure. Not trying is failure. So we've got to get busy. We've got to learn to do this because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are trafficked, who, when they're rescued, need the church to be ready to know how to minister to them. And even beyond this, every person you meet needs some level of deliverance. I have prayed with many, many people now, and I have yet to meet a single person who doesn't uh, deal with some level of rejection. And uh, but divorce is rampant, sexual abuse is rampant, incest is rampant, rape is rampant. All these things are very serious matters. Abortion, uh, you know, uh, these things are widespread. Um, there are so many people. Addiction, if you've got addictions, you've got demons. Uh, and so uh, addiction is rampant. There are demons everywhere, and there are demonized people everywhere. And who is going to help them if we don't? I can't do it all. I have my schedule absolutely crammed. Uh, even doing this podcast um, is something that I uh, have to make time for because there are so many people in need of deliverance and in need of prayer and in need of discipleship, and I can't do it all myself. Um, so you are qualified, uh, and you can do something, and you can do something that uh, the military cannot do. You can do something that special operations cannot do unless they know Jesus. You can you are you know how to do something that only that you or you're empowered at least to do something that only Christians can do. Only people who submit themselves to the lordship of Jesus and exercise his authority. So if you're not going to do it, who is? So right now as we close this particular podcast, I'm going to pray for you uh for you to have boldness, for you to have the faith to step out and try it, for you to have the confidence in God's love that even if you fail, you haven't failed, that even if you fall right on your face, God loves you and accepts you and is pleased with your attempts. But he's not pleased with our lack of attempts. Jesus didn't give us uh, authority and power so we could sit on it. Jesus said, greater things will you do because I go to the Father. Have you done greater things than Jesus yet? Have you cast out one demon yet? Have you prayed for anyone who was sick and saw them get healed yet? Have you shared the gospel with anyone, saw them saved, baptized them, and began to disciple them yet? Because Jesus did that all over the place. And he said, greater things will we do because he has gone to the Father. And Jesus right now sits at the right hand of the Father, having subjected all the powers in heaven and on earth Every principality and power in the heavenly places is subject to Jesus. And the lordship of Jesus is made known in the earth. That is already done. It's a deed that's done. Jesus already has taken up his great power and has begun to reign. Satan has already been thrown down from heaven like lightning. But it's not known in the world until the children of God begin to exercise that authority and power, which is why Paul says in Romans 8 that all creation waits eagerly in anticipation for the revealing of the sons of God, and because creation itself longs to be set free from its captivity. So you, son of God, daughter of God, creation is waiting for you to begin to move in the authority that God that. God won for you, that Jesus died on the cross to give you. He paid for it already. It's a a massive weapon. It's a massive treasure, and it's sitting right there on the table not being used, and it has your name on it. It was designed for you to use. Only you can use your life. Only you can exercise the authority that Jesus gave specifically to you. You have a ministry to do that nobody else can do, and unless you do it, it won't get done. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. 
He didn't say at any point, there are too many people trying to do this ministry. There are too many worship leaders. There are too many preachers. There are too many people casting out demons. There are too many people healing the sick. Never. He did say the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. And when you read the Gospels, read the first six chapters of Mark, you're going to see Jesus proclaim the Gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, and constantly it says, the crowds were so large, Jesus has to get into a boat. The crowds came near the door so that no one could even get in. So people had to cut a hole in the roof to lower people down. That people crammed near near Jesus and they could not get close enough to touch him. This is what happens when you do the works of Jesus. So many churches right now are begging people to come into their buildings and prop up their buildings uh, and prop up their programs. Jesus never did that. Jesus cast out demons, healed the sick, and proclaimed the gospel, and people pressed near him so much so that he didn't have time to eat. And even when he tried to escape uh, for a brief time to take a break, he said the crowds followed him. And when he saw them, the compassion of Jesus was stirred, and he continued to minister because he said they're like sheep without a shepherd. The nature of people is that they long to be reconciled with God. They long to be healed. Satan wants to block that. Satan wants to destroy that. And he, he, he has blinded the church to think that people don't want to be saved. They do. Most people do want to be saved. Most people don't believe they can be saved. Most people don't believe that they can be saved from a pornographic addiction, that they can be saved from their anger, that they can be saved from their lust. They don't believe that they can be saved from cocaine and heroin. They don't believe that they can be saved from the bitterness and the loneliness and the curses in their life. They don't believe that they can be rescued from the nightmares at night, but they can. And the church needs to stop being silent. You need to stop being silent. God has given you an anointing. God has given you a gift. And he's just waiting for you. The world is waiting for you to pick that up and use it. I prayed over the last couple of years, Lord, give me a weapon. Give me a sword and I will use it. Give me a hammer and I will let it fly. Well, the Lord has given me that sword. And it is the authority and the power of Jesus. I actually have had it all my life. I just didn't know how to use it. But I've picked it up and I've begun to swing it. And as I swing it, it gets sharper and my arms get stronger. So this is your calling. And God is going, you may feel inadequate. You may feel like this, this can't be, I can't do this. That's a lie. Satan wants you to believe that because he doesn't want you to do it. He doesn't want you to evict him. He doesn't want you to mess up his plans. He wants to destroy the world and fire and brimstone. But Jesus died to save the world. So you need to apply that victory of Jesus by exercising the gift that God has given you. So Jesus, right now, I pray for every person listening under the sound of my voice. God is calling you. Even if you have never called yourself a Christian before, God is calling you. Jesus doesn't recognize Christians and non-Christians when he thinks, uh, when he looks out and says, they're Who can I bless? Who can I love? He looks for people with a willing heart. Jesus doesn't save good people. Jesus saves people who become good because of Jesus in them. So if you have never called Jesus Lord, and you're but you want to do something about human trafficking, then right now say, Jesus, I surrender. I surrender to you. I want to be used by you to rescue the poor. Uh, and to preach the good news of your lordship and your justice. So I surrender to you right now. And let me say it to every person out there dealing with pornographic addiction, that is human trafficking. Porn is human trafficking. If you care about those who are being trafficked, the first thing you need to do is repent and be delivered from the spirit of pornography and sexual perversion. And maybe it even came down the family line like you were addicted before you even could remember anything else. And God has mercy. He's not, I'm not condemning you and neither is God. But you do need to repent and be delivered from that because that is human trafficking. So right now I come against the spirit of lust and I command you to go right now. To, I remove you from the life of every person listening right now. They don't want you. You don't belong. Go right now. Lord, I just release a power of courage. I release the power of courage from the Holy Spirit. Lord, I release the healing virtue of Jesus. Be healed from your fear of man. Be delivered from your fear of man. Be delivered from the rejection. Be healed from the rejection. Every curse of rejection, I break you right now. Fear of man, go right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I just want to speak to the timidity 
in the souls of Christians right now. Uh, they're f- they're afraid of rejection. They're afraid of failure. They think that they're not good enough. I just declare that those are lies. You are good enough. God has made you good enough. Jesus has called you in spite of your failings. He has equipped you. It's his power to deliver. It's his power in you and through you, but it is his power. It's not your power. You don't have to feel powerful. You don't have to be smart. You just have to be obedient. So I just release you from the the lies that said you have to be a perfect Christian before you can do the ministry. I release you from the lies of your mom and your dad who shamed you, who said you're, who, who said you're not a good Christian. Uh, and so you've been living under that shame and you haven't been able to move because of it. I just release you from that right now. Jesus forgives you. Jesus qualifies you. Jesus calls you. You are called right now. God is calling you into the ministry. God is calling you to minister to your neighbor. God is calling you to minister to your sister and to your uncle and to your friend. So I just release you from the lie that you're not qualified and that you're not good enough. Jesus qualifies you. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. So I bless you right now. Receive the Holy Spirit from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Receive joy, receive courage, receive peace, and receive power, and receive the love of the scriptures. Lord, I just release a love of scripture over every person under the sound of my voice right now. Lord, I remove every witchcraft spirit that has blinded eyes, that has caused people to be sleepy when they read, that has made them confused, that's made them disinterested, they're just not able to focus. I command every spirit of confusion, go right now. Every mind-controlling spirit, go right now. Every witchcraft spirit of blindness, go right now. You have no right, no portion, no place here. Go right now. Lord, I just release fire over your word that you breathe on it right now so every person would feel a draw to the scriptures. And when they read them, they will come to life and they will understand them and be able to apply them. And they will hide it in their hearts so they will not sin against you. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. And I thank you for your blood, which has purchased for us victory, which has snatched us from hell and filled us with the fire of heaven. So Lord, we receive your fire. We receive your your revival. Thank you for those who will be baptized. Thank you for those ministries that are being birthed right now as I'm speaking. Thank you for those who are listening and who are receiving in their hearts, yes, this is for me. I am called. I will be obedient. I bless your obedience right now. Jesus is going to use you. He is going to perform the miracles you need. Wait on him. Trust on him. Trust in him and obey while you're waiting. You can share the gospel while you're waiting. You can pray for people while you're waiting. A lot of times we're waiting for the big thing and Jesus is actually in the little things. And the little things become big things. They are the big things, but they you need to focus on the little things first. So I just bless you now as you obey. And I bless the reading of the word. And I bless you with unity with other Christians around you. I bless you with friends who will stand by you in this journey. And I will stand by you too. I would love to hear from you what, how this has affected you, what God is doing in your life, what ministry he's called you to. All right, God bless you guys. I'm going to go now, and I'll see you next time here on the Faith of the Fathers podcast. God bless you.